Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for being here tonight. We have Kelvin Eaton and he will be talking about what does it mean to be anti-racist. A few reminders and information. The lecture portion will be recorded. Q&A will not be recorded. Um, well, relevant questions will be answered throughout the lecture. You can put them in the chat box and Crystal and I will be monitoring those. So submit your questions there and we will go ahead and funnel those through to Kevin. And we know that this is very brief and introductory. It's a beginning, not an end, and uh, the start to long-term work that we're going to be doing in Brighton. So Kelvin Eaton is a disabled community educator, content creator, and social entrepreneur whose area of expertise includes anti-racism, equity, justice, instructional design, and program development. In 2016, Mr. Eaton founded 540 West Main Incorporated, a virtual nonprofit organization and anti-racist education brand that promotes justice for all. Kelvin, thank you so much for being here, and I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, Tamika. I'm really happy to be here with you all this evening um, on this Monday. Um, I'm, I'm still, as, as most of us are, sort of getting ready for or getting used to um, the, the, the darkness that comes so quickly. Um, so I want to go ahead and get started. I'm um, just to reinforce some of what Tamika was sharing um, a little earlier. Uh, we recognize that tonight we have about an hour and a half and it's going to go by very quickly especially as we engage in the topic around racism and anti-racism very you know very deep sensitive topics and we recognize and just want to communicate to all of you again and reinforce that we recognize that we're not going to be able to um, cover all there is to cover around especially institutional and systemic racism and what that might look like and might be looking like for you as parents as it relates to the Brighton School District and as community members, but this is the beginning of, of ongoing work that the PTA, the Brighton PTA is engaging in. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to have um, Dr. Tamika Wagstaff and Crystal Ellis um, as part of this work. Um, they, and just to sort of give you all some context as to how, how this conversation came to be this evening, um, Tamika and um, Crystal re re reached out to me. Um, those of you who don't know, um, I am the founding director of 540 West Main, and I'm also um, an anti-racism educator and practitioner um, here in the community. And um, 540, we're a nonprofit organization. We're a virtual organization now, and our mission really is to promote justice for all by way of um, courses and classes that we curate and program um, that are rooted in social justice and anti-racism. And so the Brian PTA, um, as you all know, or, or some of you might know or may not know, is engaged in having conversations and looking at how can the Brighton Central School District be more inclusive, be more diverse, and be more anti-racist in how it's um, engaging in students, engaging with families, and engaging with family members. And um, there are many individuals involved at the PTA level, but also at the district level to improve the outcomes um, and what's happening within the district that some of you might be aware of. I'm sure many of you have had on, on conversations with other PTA members, but specifically as it relates to the PTA, you know, when, when we're talking about structural racism and institutional racism, especially as it relates to the, the sector of, of higher education or of, of K through 12 education, it's really important that we recognize that we, we have to be looking at ourselves and engaging in this work at every level, um, at the level of um, not just the broad level as, you know, thinking about like how teachers are interacting with students, but, you know, we also want to look internally, look at our board, look at our administration, and look at the PTA. And um, oftentimes when we engage in the work around anti-racism practice, we can become very siloed in our conversations. And we really have to always be looking at um, our own individual lenses, um, our interpersonal lenses, and then those individual or those um, institutional and systemic lenses. And um, the PTA is recognizing that it itself also um, needs to be holding itself accountable to practicing anti-racism and what that looks like at the PTA level, how that how the, the PTA is, is um, engaging in this work and helping to move the district in a direction in which that it is more equitable for all. So 
Um, I'm really happy to just be a, a, a part of, of many players as it relates to the PTA level. Um, Tamika and Crystal being parents and have children attending um, the Brighton Central School District um, and, and other schools in the district as well. So um, that's just to give you all a little bit of context as to um, how we got here today um, and what you can expect. Um, let's see. I just, I'm sorry, I just looked at a comment. There we go. Looks like we were, I was blocking some of you with my, my screen here. So thank you for sharing that. So um, we will have a dedicated section at the end of today to talk about, um, to have Q A Q and A. Several of you submitted questions ahead of time and we'll also be able to take questions that come in real time as I go through this information with you all this evening. So just to jump into some objectives, um, it's my hope and our hope that you're able to, when you leave this conversation tonight, begin to think about and understand um, the, and define the four modalities of racism, um, understand how racism permeates all aspects of culture and society, define anti-racism, and then understand ways in which you can practice anti-racism individually um, with your families, um, interpersonally, and also within the district itself. And so before we get into understanding really anti-racist practice and anti-racist action, we have to be able to step back and think about our prior knowledge and really um, for purposes of our conversation this evening, but also that we're all on the same page tonight, when I'm talking about racism this evening, particularly, you know, and, and also holistically, you know, what is racism, right? We, we talk a lot, there's a lot of, racism has become a, a buzzword in a sense in terms of how we are talking about it as a culture within media, um, within academia, et cetera. What is racism? And really racism is prejudice and power combined, right? And so just very briefly here, this, this slide here that we have, it breaks up racism into four modalities. We first have individualized racism, we have interpersonal racism, we have institutional racism, and we have structural racism. Tonight we're gonna to remain very, um, we're gonna we're gonna sort of remain most in the realms of institutional and structural racism this evening. I think as a culture, we talk a lot, we, we stay, we remain, oftentimes, especially those of us who are not as comfortable who, or who may not have the tools and language to talk about racism, we, we often are um, having our conversation center a lot around internalized and interpersonal racism, right? We really wanna push our thinking and really start to think about how racism in, impacts the lived experiences of people of color, black people, et cetera, um, at the institutional and structural racism, especially as we'll learn as we get into the structural racism realm, it oftentimes is not always easy to call it out. It's not always explicit. It doesn't always look like um, a, a racial slur or someone using the N-word. It doesn't look like a KKK a person who's a member of the KKK or a white supremacist group. It often is shape-shifting, it's hiding itself, it's very implicit in the structural realm and that's why it's so important and vital for us to understand what it looks like and really be prepared to discuss it. An overview, internalized racism are prejudices and biases and beliefs um, that are held about people because of the color of their skin. This can look like internalized oppression and internalized privilege. Inter interpersonal racism when individuals are acting on these individual prejudices um, and biases and beliefs about people based on their skin. And then you begin to add action to it. So you think about microaggressions, you think about racial slurs and bigotry, you think about hate crimes, you think about sort of um, explicit dis discrimination, um, many things that we've seen across the United States, the history of the United States with Jim Crow laws, those, you know, se separate but equal, which was not racial violence, lynchings, etc. That interpersonal violence are things that people are really readily able to recognize. You know, oftentimes people say that I would, I'd never do that, or I'd never act that way, or I'd never say that wearing, you know, painting yourself in blackface for Halloween. 
those interpersonal racist acts are, are often, again, where we remain. But we don't talk a lot uh, enough about um, and, and what's become harder for us to recognize and then be able to dismantle is institutional racism. So now we're moving into structures, we're moving into policies, practices within institutions like school districts that routinely produce and create racial inequity. So what does that look like? What does institutional racism look like? What might it look like in the Brighton Central School District or within a school within the district or within a system within the district? It might look like the lack of Black, Indigenous, BIPOC, people of color, faculty and administration. Um, it might be showing up in the curriculum that Brighton is using. Is the curriculum centering whiteness? Is it centering the experiences of white people? Is it lacking intersectionality? Is it lacking um, books? Is it lacking discussions that are written and produced by Black people and other non-Black people of color? Um, cultural norms, defaults of whiteness that prioritize white people being uncomfortable. So sometimes this might look like teachers or administrators um, saying that they would never be racist. A policy could never be racist, right? It looks like in a classroom that teachers don't talk about or students are not um, encouraged to talk about how their race and their identity impact their daily lived experiences, not only within the greater culture, but also within the school community. Um, it, it, it can look like norms prioritizing the feelings of white people over the feelings of black students and staff and faculty, right? It looks like black students feeling or feeling isolated or being on an island. Um, we've had some very candid conversations internally um, with the PTA around urban suburban students and, and many people still feeling like um, urban suburban students that attend right in schools um, are really um, alone by themselves, they're othered, they're not part of the greater community. And me being someone who is a um, graduate of the urban suburban program, I can echo these sentiments, right? I went to Brockport from sixth grade to my senior year in high school, and I was one of less than 50 black students that attended on Brockport at that time. And oftentimes, you know, as an urban suburban student, we sat together, we had a community together, and, and sometimes that was, um, not always included in the greater school community, right? Especially when Black students do not have faculty and teachers that look like them, you begin to feel that isolation because you don't see yourself represented um, in the leadership functions of the school. And that was the case in Brockport when I was attending um, middle and high school there. I know that it's still very similar conversations in terms of teacher diversity, Brighton, Brockport, Pittsburgh, et cetera, they have not made many strides in by way of teacher diversity, even in 2020. And we have to keep asking ourselves, is it because there are there's a lack of teachers of qualified talent um, for these school districts to hire from? Or is it a combination of that and many other things in which black teachers, non-black teachers of color don't feel comfortable staying or teaching in the district? Um, are there hiring practices that are implicitly racist or implicitly biased against um, teachers of color? Is it some larger systemic conversations around um, how New York State is looking at the pipeline for educators? These things all combine to where you have very normalized experiences of Black students in which they don't see themselves represented in the school function of the, the education system. And we talk a little bit about also the behavior of Black students, the perception that their behavior is criminal, and then it's penalized in a way in which the same behavior, the same action from a white student is not. We know that historically um, across all um, districts, not just anyone in particular, that Black students are disproportionately suspended Black young women are disproportionately suspended at schools for behaviors in which a white counterpart would not be suspended for. And many students can speak to those situations in which they felt like they were being treated differently. They were being looked at differently because of the color of their skin and identity. Um, and then we also have um, systemic conversations within the institution of a school district like Brighton where Black students are routinely denied access to gifted or advanced classes and then recommended disproportionately to special education. You know, we, we know that across 
districts in New York State, Black students are disproportionately um, not placed in advanced placement classes. Their parents might not even know that advanced placement classes are even an option for them. Why is that, right? Why do Black students continue to share these experiences around how the institution is replicating and reinforcing racist policies, racist ideals, racist cultural norms, right? We really have to think about that within the institution. And then, of course, institutions make up structures. But before we get into really understanding structural racism, I want to play a short clip. I think that in terms of really understanding um, how racism impacts the lived experiences of Black students, of Black young people, um, of all young people, no matter how they identify, it's really important to hear stories from them. And so I want to share a clip from the New York Times via YouTube that um, has specifically Black students talking about um, their experiences, Black young men, Black boys, um, I should say Black boys, how they, um, how they feel growing up black and so i think it's really powerful and it helps drive the point home on how in institutional racism and structural racism really does have a very real impact on the lived experiences of students of color Racism means basically like a large part of a, a race feels that they're superior to another race. And so, and so not only do they believe that, but they act on it. Examples would be in class. Sometimes I'd be the only black kid and we read a book like, I don't know, Huck Finn. And then there's that uncomfortable moment, the, the magic word <laughs> come up and people would look at you like, what's his reaction and things like that. I was walking home from school with this one white girl and we just gone off the bus and we were about to, we were almost home. And there were these group of black kids that just gone out of school. And she was like, oh, let's cross the street. There's a group of black kids. I don't want to run into them. And so she told me, which I don't even know why she would do that. It's what a sweatband like just to reinforce my wrist. And I had a teacher come up to me and say, you should take it off because it looks gang affiliated. I've been in situations where, you know, I had to cross the street because I didn't want to scare the white lady that was walking. I would actually, it would get to the point where I would start to count how many times a woman would clutch her bag. When I was 16, I was leaving my mom's house in my pajamas, which had snowmen on them, um, with my brother. And we were actually stopped by the police rather aggressively. I've been stopped by the cops on my way between classes, because we have two separate buildings, walking from one building to the other building, as my white students in the same class walk by me. It's kind of upsetting, because we live in a world where my mom has to be afraid I walk outside from the people that are like meant to protect me and I just I don't like when my mother feels like that you know I love my mother she should always I want her to always be happy you know I walk tall I keep my head up very you know try to be very articulate and, and polite um and so I, of course I was like okay I'm, I'm gonna be fine because I act a certain way and of course that has absolutely nothing to do with it um people the way people perceive you you know is not up to you. My parents taught me, oh, you know, cops are your friends. You're supposed to, you know, they're here to protect you. But all I'm seeing is the opposite. So how can I not be free, afraid when I feel like I'm being hunted? When I feel like I'm there to fill a quota. We are in a so-called free society. And as a black man, we literally don't feel free. Um, we don't know what freedom is. Every time we're, we're killed, the first thing you see on the news is oh, criminal record or something like that. So from the from the second the bullet hits us, already we're starting to be dehumanized. With black people like myself, we don't get as many chances as, as, as they do. So you have to be aware and you have to watch out and you can't mess up. This was an extremely emotionally taxing process for me in terms of coming to terms with maybe 
the, the nature of, of racism in my own life and in this country and in this world. And if you wait until somebody is 12, 13, and 14 to put that on them, it's, it's really, it can be really difficult. My dad, he's just like the honest one. He's like, listen, son, like there are things in this world like you have to, you kind of have to watch out. He doesn't want me to live in fear, but he wants me to be aware. I want people to know that I'm perfectly fine and I'm not gonna hurt anybody or do anything bad. And I should be judged about like who I who I am and like and what kind of person I am. My parents would tell me, especially my mom, she would tell me, you have to endure, you have to muscle through it, and like, and this is no different. It's part of being a person of color in America. And there's a certain comfortability associated with that because if I know if something is inevitable, then I know how to deal with it. I, fortunately, I've had parents who have said, this is what you do. Mom and dad, I'll be fine because you did a good job raising me. Uh, you gave me all the resources and the time and the blood, sweat, and tears um, to make me a good man, an honorable man, and the foundation to survive in this country. I want you to know that I will act in an appropriate manner and do everything that you told me to do because I do love you. And I know that everything you say is not for a reason and not just to talk to talk. And I love you. Okay. So that video is very powerful and I think that it's really important that, you know, we we think about for sure you know, as we connect with students and teachers and faculty and administration, it's so important that we listen and we, we make space for Black students um, to talk about their lived experiences. You know, there's a lot of questions coming in today about action and what people can do. And I think that we have to get to a place as a culture in which we're not scared about having these types of conversations because we can't really make true change until we actually begin to face these conversations head on. Um, and, and the only way to really do that is to really think about, you know, um, listening to the voices of students of color for sure. So we, we've understanding in, institutional racism. Now we're going to um, move into really understanding how these institutions make up our culture and really the structural racism that lies underneath and all across society, right? So structural racism encompasses our cultures, um, the history, the way in which we teach this country, the history of this country, what we omit, what we erase, what we promote, whose voices that we promote. Um, if not familiar, not, not sure if you're familiar with the 1619 Project um, with the New York Times and how um, there is a, a reclaiming, a reframing of how we're, we've even, um, taught ourselves about American history and whose voice is at the center of that in our textbooks, in our, you know, in the, in the books that are written about history, oftentimes we've seen that the perspective of Black Americans, of Black descendants of enslaved people that were um, enslaved to this country um, have not been promoted and they've actually been excluded from the conversations, from our academic conversations, and they have not been promoted. And then structural racism also makes up the interconnected institutions and policies that inform relationships and rules across our society, providing the legitimacy and reinforcements to maintain and perpetuate racism. And so it's so important that we remain and when we talk about um, dismantling, creating anti-racist policies, we have to keep ourselves rooted in the institutional racism and then in the structural racism conversations. And so that's really important for us. And I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. Um, 
in terms of the pillars that make up structural racism, our, our, our culture and what our dominant culture is, there are five pillars that I really like to highlight in the work that I do. Um, number one is public education. That's the realm in which we all are having the conversation here this evening. Housing, prisons, politics, and healthcare. But really, I'm, as I'm looking at this list, it really should be reframed and reimagined as a circle, right? A circular system in which we know that the school to prison pipeline is very real and a tool of white supremacy to criminalize students while they're in the public education system and that leads them to um, having a criminal record sometimes at eight, nine years old. There's, there was a situation right at the start of COVID in which um, a, a teacher was on Zoom with a group of students um, a black young man, a black boy, a student in her class, she saw a toy Nerf gun um, in the background, um, brought it to the attention of the child's mother or parent, and the parent goes on to share that the police and superintendent were at her door um, 30 minutes later after she had talked to the teacher and assured the teacher that it was a Nerf gun, that it was not a real gun. And you think about students, something, a situation like that in which nine, 10 year old youth, young people are um, arrested, right? We've seen um, black little girls as young as preschool and kindergarten being arrested by the police in different situations. And um, how do we normalize that type of dehumanization of our students really leads us into we have conversations in which we've normalized um, the dehumanization of black people as as they relate to the prison system and so there is a parallel there is a thread there's an interconnectedness between these modalities healthcare, politics the political system prisons housing public education and how they make up what we understand as structural racism. So I wanna just take a pause here because this is a lot of information again. We're at the 30 minute mark of our conversation together. Just want to um, have a ping to one of my co on my panelists here, um, Crystal or um, Tamika, are there any um, relevant real time questions or conversations coming in right now around understanding what it is that when we talk about racism, what we're, what we're referring to? There is not anything in the Q&A or the chat at this moment. Okay. Let me just make sure that my screen is blown up here. There we go. Well, I am going to take a pause for some water for me. So now that we have a better understanding for what is racism, we can understand what does it mean? What does it mean to be anti-racist? So before we get into some of the, the academics around it and the definitions, I have another clip for you all to watch. Um, it's about eight minutes or so to really understand and get a foundational understanding of what does it mean to be anti-racist. And then we can get into some conversations around what that might look like um, what are some practices that that are that are racist that we might be seeing in the in the Brighton pitch on the, in the Brighton school district in the Brighton community and how we can counter that with anti-racism practice. Now, when I was growing up, I had friends from all different types of backgrounds, and I mean, race was something that we never really talked about that often. But there would be times where someone would say a off the hook kind of comment or make a joke that I thought was pretty offensive or out of pocket. And it became very clear that their parents or whoever never really talked to them about race. And I mean, I understand race can be an uncomfortable topic to talk about. But with the police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless other black people over the years and decades, fired up protesters from all walks of life are leaning into that discomfort to speak out against police brutality and structural racism. And on the front lines of these protests are young people. I am here today because black future in this country is in crisis. It has been in crisis for a long time. The fact that people are still being killed with impunity by this force that is supposed to be protecting and serving us um, is absolutely unacceptable. 
there are things in this country that have been set up since, again, with the institution of slavery that make it hard for Black people to be able to live comfortably and freely without um, having some sort of resistance or feeling like their life is being threatened on a constant basis. There's lack of accountability. People aren't, you know, being told what they're doing is wrong. And so it creates this ideology that what they're doing is okay and not just perpetuates a system that puts everybody down, you know? In the wake of these protests, the term anti-racism is popping up all over the place. There's TED Talks on anti-racism, books about anti-racism are hitting the top of the bestsellers list. Even late night comedians are trying to understand what exactly the term means. You also talk about the difference between not racist and anti-racist. Can you yes. differentiate yes. that for me? But anti-racism isn't a new word. It has a history and was used by civil rights movements throughout the 20th century. And now it's making a comeback. So today we're diving in and asking, what is anti-racism and what does it mean to be anti-racist? Before we tackle what anti-racism means, let's all get on the same page about what racism means. You've got in your face racism where a person is prejudiced against another person because of the color of their skin. But it can also be more subtle, like not hiring someone because they have a black sounding name. But when that kind of prejudice gets baked into society, like it has in the US, you get structural or systemic racism, which is when a society is designed in a way that reinforces and perpetuates discrimination against certain races. You want an example? Oh, well, here's an example. Between 2012 and 2016, black males convicted of a crime received sentences on average 19% longer than white males convicted of essentially the same crime. Perhaps black offenders don't make as much money as white offenders, so they can't afford good lawyers. Maybe black people get judges that hand down stricter sentences. Maybe it's both. But that's the point. Society has been structured in a way that hurts black people harder. And it largely stems from one of the darkest stains on American history, slavery. Systemic racism is really coming out of racial slavery. And ever since racial slavery in this country, black people were not necessarily considered citizens. That's Peniel Joseph, a professor at UT Austin who specializes in civil rights history. And so ever since, even after the end of slavery, systemic racism meant that Black people were segregated to certain parts of cities, like in Austin, Texas, where I live, but that could be Oklahoma, it could be Los Angeles, New York. Um, they had less access to land in the South, but they had less access to getting uh, businesses in, in the North and everywhere. Um, it means that they're treated differently by the criminal justice system, by police, um, basically in all walks of life. You know, in our conversations that we have with young people, a lot of it made me feel like they view racism and all these issues as if they live in this, like, bubble of the past. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like all those things you're talking about, like, oh, black people couldn't go to certain places, couldn't do certain things. And it's like people kind of go, well, like, you can now, so what's the problem? I think part of what is so powerful as a historian is narrative. And I think the narrative that we've told ourselves is that one, we don't talk about racial slavery, so that's taboo, so shh about racial slavery. The other is that there was a woman named Rosa Parks who was awesome, and she refused to sit on a segregated bus. And then you had Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who really was leading the March on Washington, but then he unfortunately was killed. But then you say Barack Obama was elected in 2008, and you have a black president and a black first lady, uh, Michelle Obama, and you basically say that's the story of the civil rights movement in the United States, where there's a happy ending. We said we're post-racial, but then when we really look closer, we say we, we can see that we're really not post-racial. There's all these different things that are still unjust and unequal in our society, and this is connected to something much larger. Rules or policies may appear race neutral, but in practice, they aren't. And that's true not just at the federal or the state level, but at the local level too. Take school dress codes. It makes sense that schools don't want students to be distracted by revealing or inappropriate clothing. But the problem is what's considered distracting or inappropriate is really subjective and can end up reinforcing white norms. For example, do-rags, dreadlocks, and braids often get banned, which all affect black students more. And when you look at the data around how school dress codes are enforced, that's what you see. Black girls end up being disciplined more harshly than their white peers. I know when I was in middle school and I had braids, I had to shave my head when I started at a new school. I don't know what that has to do with my learning capabilities, and I still don't know nearly 15 years later, but I did it. According to anti-racism, in order to address systemic racism, simply being not racist isn't enough. 
To quote Ibram X. Kendi, a historian and leading scholar of race and discriminatory policy in America, the opposite of racist isn't not racist, it is anti-racist, and that requires work. Emmanuel Acho, a sports analyst and former NFL player, went on Stephen Colbert and did a great job explaining this. It's not enough in 2020 to be not racist. Not racist meaning I am passive when it comes to racism. That's what I mean by being anti-racist, Stephen. It's not just, okay, just because I don't say the N-word or just because I'm not scared of Black people. If you see it, you have to speak on it and call it out. Anti-racism is an active state of mind. It's the active process of identifying and opposing racism. Being anti-racist means also calling out racist policies and institutions um, and cultures that might not seem racist, but that are racist because they have um, a disparate impact on Black people. Examples are everywhere. Voter ID laws that disenfranchise Black and Brown voters, majority non-white school districts getting less money per student than districts with mostly white students, housing policies over the decades that have kept Black people in poor communities with less home ownership. When we think about racism, there's kind of no neutrality. It's either that you're trying to constantly oppose it, um, or you sort of fall victim to being part of the status quo, because we, we live in a society where there is systemic racism. In researching this episode, I did come across some opposition to anti-racism as a set of beliefs. I'm not talking about people who don't think racism exists or who don't think it's a big deal. I'm talking about people who recognize that systemic racism is a problem, but take issue with the either or aspect that is at the center of the anti-racist philosophy. That you're either anti-racist or racist. There is no middle ground. So every conversation, every government policy is either explicitly working toward racial equality or it's actively working against it. This all or nothing approach has some critics comparing anti-racism to a religion where any questioning of the philosophy is interpreted as an attack it can shut down questions and new ideas. Now, here at Above the Noise, we're not gonna tell you what to think. You gotta do that work and make up your own mind. However, if you're curious about what it takes to be anti-racist, here are some general steps. Step one is taking stock of any bias or prejudice that you may have and then challenging those thoughts. Personally, I've had well-intentioned white people say things to me like, you're so well-spoken for, you're so cultured. And in their minds, they're totally offering me a compliment, but it's definitely not a compliment. It's for sure an insult. But it's also important to understand that you don't have to be perfect to be anti-racist. I love this quote from Ijoma Aluo, a Nigerian-American writer. The beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be an anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself, and it's the only way forward. Step two is educating yourself about how racism is systemic. It's about understanding what kinds of policies produce negative outcomes for people of color. We gave you some examples, so now you can't say you don't know what systemic racism is or that it's not a problem. And there are more examples to read up on and understand. Step three is taking action. At the individual level, that means speaking up when a friend says a racist joke or a family member uses a racist stereotype. In the moment, it can be easier to just stay silent and not rock the boat. But anti-racism demands you call it out and address it. At the structural level, it's thinking through how to dismantle racist policies to create new policies to help level the playing field. So, using the dress codes example we talked about earlier, maybe you educate teachers about stereotypes so they don't unfairly target black girls. Maybe you ask students to write their own dress codes that reflect their values. Or maybe you just get rid of dress codes altogether. It's a lifetime of work. Uh, and you can think of that as either good or bad, but you have to work on it. This is not something you do for one day or one week or one year. You have to keep it up and you have to bequeath that legacy to your children and grandchildren as well. All right, folks, that's our dive into anti-racism. Now we want to hear from you. Okay, thank you for watching that clip here, helping us to get a better understanding of what it means to be, what is anti-racism. So let me just jump back into our screen here. So really just reinforcing the clip for us and helping us to just sort of drive the point home, anti-racism is the active process of identifying and eliminating racism by changing systems, organizational structures, policies, practices, and attitudes so that power is redistributed and shared equitably. That's an, um, a definition directly from the um, NAC, 
international perspectives, women in global solidarity. And sort of in our clip, we really highlighted that when we talk about anti-racism and what it means to be anti-racist, it's talking about an active process, right? So it's not enough to just say that you're not racist. You have to also be working to um, identify and root, root out biases that you've grown up with, that we've all been indoctrinated with from our upbringing, from our backgrounds. Um, we have to be able to look at ourselves and all of these things that we carry with us in, in our respective areas of work. Um, but we also have to be um, willing to call out systems and dismantle oppressive systems and structures. Um, and also that looks like being called out. Sometimes you're called in, sometimes you're called out, right? So an anti-racist notices biases, notices to discrimination, notices prejudice and works against it. Um, an anti-racist calls out racist policy and works to make policies um, that are anti-racist and then hold the policymakers accountable for this. Um, an anti-racist does not pretend to be free of racism, but recognizes that it's an active, ongoing, long-term, in most cases, a lifelong process because we are all living under a system in which it has, has proliferated and has um, really indoctrinated and encoded in policy and law that whiteness is the standard that in anything that deviates from that is somehow subpar, is somehow not normal, is somehow not right. And that is how our laws, our policies, our procedures, our norms, all of these things um, sort of are, are, are rooted from that foundation. When we talk about the, the, the history of this country and that or in that you know all men are equal, it was not talking about all men and all people. It was not talking about all persons. And in fact, when, when the Constitution was signed and, and created, we had we were living in a time period in which black people were not even considered human. And then so we really have to remember that that is the root of this country. That is the foundation. And just because we ignore it and just because we may not want to talk about it, that is something that is impacting all of our lived experiences on a day-to-day -day level, but especially individuals that fit under that social construct of that they're not white, right? And so we have to remember that it's almost impossible to exist and not be free of racism because it is part of our ethos, not just in the US, but globally, right? And that's why it's a constant active work that we're recognizing it, that we're changing, that we're trying to dismantle it. It takes collective and consistent, sustained action. It's not just um, a social media statement. It's not just a photo on social media. It's not just an initiative, but this is really embedding it at the foundational level of an institution like the Brighton Central School District, right? Or Brighton School District. Um, and it's, it's being committed to fighting against racism everywhere, including in ourselves. And so um, in terms of really looking at and recognizing some ways in which we might be able to push the Brighton District to be more anti-racist and how it's practicing. These are just four examples that I thought of very broadly. Um, we can certainly discuss more examples um, that you all might be seeing or have experiences or thoughts that you have as it relates to the district um, from your role as a community member or a parent or a student. Number one, making the commitment with SMART. So that acronym SMART, um, S-M-A-R-T, um, specific, measurable, actional, um, realistic, and time-based goals to diversify with dates, administration, and faculty body. We are getting to the point where we cannot continue to talk about we want diverse faculty, we want diverse teachers, we want teachers that don't look that, that are more representative of the, the area in which we live in. If we do not set, if the district does not set actionable goals with dates in a timeline in which it's board, in which its administrative body, and in which its faculty will begin to be more diverse, then it will not happen. It will simply not happen. We will continue to have these conversations and be sitting here five, 10, and 20 years from now still saying that we, we have this as a goal, but we're not ceding any power to do it. In order to 
have an, in, an institution look more diverse and not have the same people, that means that some people will have to step aside or step down or get out of the way and you have to support and promote other diverse people to be in those leadership positions we have to make a commitment with goals and how Brighton is going to do that or it simply won't happen. We have to make sure that as parents, as a PTA, as a community, that you hold the district accountable at the levels in which you can. So for most districts, that looks like the board. It looks like who you vote on the board. What is the board's, um, what is the board's commitment to holding the district accountable, right? And how, if the board is not doing it, then as a community, you all have to vote different people in those board seats if you're finding that the current board is truly not committed to that type of work, right? Number two, you have to look at your curriculum, look at it holistically and ensure that the curriculum that the Brighton School District is um, promoting um, is not centering solely the voices of white people, that it's not centering whiteness, that it's not centering white supremacy, that you're not using textbooks that refer to racism or that refer to slavery as indentured servants or workers or that slaves were happy, right? You have to um, de decolonize the curriculum at, in very real ways. You have to make sure that teachers have ongoing professional development opportunities that not just black teachers or non-black teachers of color but also all teachers white teachers specifically understand their own biases so that they're not replicating those and how they're interacting with your students right you have to have a commitment to doing that that means that you're not shying away from the conversation that means that you're um you're promoting teachers to be able to take the initiative within their realm of influence to be able to embed this in their lessons, that you're giving them um, examples, that you're bringing in um, speakers and, and co-educators, lecturers that can really have a more holistic um, conversation with students, right? It's number three, making a commitment to support teachers and staff to have real conversations about racism and with peers and students, right? It's, it's not, stifling a teacher from saying that sh they believe that black lives matter right that a district that is being anti-racist would not do that it would understand that saying that black lives matter is not a political statement it's saying that you believe in the humanity of all people and that you're recognizing that we exist in a culture that has reinforced at every level that people of color that black people have less humanity than white people it does not mean that you're being political when you say that, right? And it's mean it's meaning that you're being committed to um, not only looking at yourself and how you might be replicating that bias against people of color or black people, but it's also that you're holding the system in which you work accountable. It's creating spaces for staff of color, for, for the faculty of color that you might have so that they feel comfortable remaining as faculty with the district and are not ostracized in others in the similar way in which students are ostracized and it makes it a culture that does not sustain diverse voices right it's allowing your allies if you're an ally it's understanding when to step aside when to step back if you're entrusting black people black women black leaders to lead conversations around this work it means that you're not getting in their way it means that you're not second guessing their perspective even if it might not align with what you thought the way that you thought that it should be done right it's it's knowing when to step up it's knowing when to step back and it's understanding that you don't always get it right every time but when you slip up you recognize it you own it you apologize and then you move forward, right? You don't stay in that place of hurt or defensiveness to the point in which you're blocking the work, right? We see that happening in so many school districts across the country, in, uh, in New York State, and we simply cannot continue in this way if we're truly being anti-racist in our practices. And then it's also, excuse me, looking at yourself, and I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice here, so I'm going to take a sip of water. Um, it's also recognizing your own individual complicity um, in being anti-racist. So 
Um, in order for us to hold policies and systems accountable, we have to also be recognizing instances of microaggressions and bias in our own selves, um, in our professional work, in our personal lives. We're asking ourselves as families, why might, it, why might we feel uncomfortable having real conversations about race and racism with our children, right? It's recognizing, it's, it's, it's finding books, it's having discussions with your children, with your families, with your friends, on individual bias, specifically from authors and scholars of color. Number two, we can hold our employers accountable to dismantle policies and practices, um, whether you're an employee of the district or not, right? It means that sometimes you have to be uncomfortable in the conversation. It's really easy when you're not the marginalized voice to say, well, that does not impact me or I don't wanna jeopardize my position or place within this institution, so I'm not going to say anything. If we have collective groups of people not saying anything, then nothing changes. And what you see happen is that people of color, they are bearing the brunt of this every single day with those microaggressions, with those, um, those jokes that are racist, that nobody calls out the person, and they're always the person who calls it out, and then they're stereotyped as the angry Black person, right? We have to not do that. Number three, we have to be open to critique and being called out. If you ever inadvertently act in a racist way, it, take, it takes a moment to not be defensive. It takes a moment if you're someone who's committed to being a better, um, to be more aligned with anti-racism practice. It takes a moment if you are called out to think about to think about that and to not be immediately defensive or dismissive of the call out, right? It takes practice and it means that we don't get it right every time, but we still make a commitment to do it even when we don't get it right. It's amplifying and supporting local social justice and anti-racist organizations and groups. And then it's also engaging in the sustained um, journey of unlearning racism by reading, watching, and engaging content by BIPOC or Black Indigenous people of color creatives right it's it's reaching out to media sources and letting the editor know that a headline or an article was implicitly racist here's why and i really would like you to change it as someone who engages with your content if we had more people holding media outlets accountable at the local level right at our local level that's one thing that you can be that you can do if recognizing racism in your everyday life and so um, we're going to just do a quick review, again, defining those four modalities of racism, the internalized racism, the interpersonal racism, institutional and structural, right? We want to, when we think about anti-racism practice, we have to be hitting points in each of those four, but especially in the, in the institutional and the structural modalities of racism, right? We have to change policy, we have to change procedure, we have to change law so that these laws are not inherently racist. If we don't do that and we only focused on the individual or interpersonal, then we don't see true systemic change. We have understanding how racism permeates all of society and culture. We discuss that, we understand that um, curriculum can be biased, the norms, the institution, the hiring practices to create environments in which Black people, non-Black people of color do not truly feel welcomed. They feel othered. They're told that their hair is not neat, that they, they're told that, they, that their look is unprofessional, that they have to assimilate to exist in an institution. Those are all the ways in which our structures reinforce racist ideals. We've defined anti-racism as that continuous practice, that journey, that action of um, not of, of dismantling and having policies that promote equity and justice for all, as opposed to the opposite. And then we hopefully understand a few ways in which the district can be more anti-racist truly. We talked about those SMART goals in terms of diversity um, for staff, administration, and for the board. There are also many more ways that I think that we're going to be able to dive into as we get into our Q&A portion of the evening. 
Before we do that, I want to share just a few resources that parents, that teachers, that administrators can be using as you think about how can Brighton District, school district, be anti-racist in this practice, practice anti-racism. These books here um, are all by Black authors and Black academics, by Black racial you know, thought leaders, racist thought leaders, or racist um, um, racial scholars, race scholars. Um, why are all the Black kids sitting together in the cafeteria by Beverly Daniel Tatum? Um, Push Out the Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools by Monique Morris, and then White Teachers, Black Students in the Spirit of Yes to African American Ach Student Achievement by Mac T. Hines III. And then these are just some other resources. I will be sending in the, um, a separate document um, to um, Dr. Wax, Staff, and Crystal um, to send out to those of you who registered, everyone who registered for this evening. Um, how to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi, Stamped um, Racism, Anti-Racism in You by Ibram X. Kendi, um, Anti-Racist Baby by Ibram X. Kendi, um, all have come out within the last two years. Um, so these are just some resources. And then a local resource, um, this is a very engaging and very empowering um, and, and inspiring um, content creator, Dante Worth. Um, he did a Overcoming Biases episode of his show on YouTube. Um, with Nancy Sung Shelton, who is an amazing um, community um, change agent here in Rochester. And it's, it's about, a, I think, less than 10 minutes or 10 minutes or so. Um, it's really worth the watch, and, and that will be on the resource guide as well. So I have a couple of comments and questions here um, that we definitely want to get into um, in this conversation today. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Crystal and Tamika just to um, start to um, answer, ask live the questions that some of you are um, bringing in tonight. Great, thank you so much for that, Calvin. That was so um, on time and so for, and it's so healthy to have those conversations, especially um, in education and within within the district so that we can start the process of healing and welcoming all individuals into this into this district so we can have an inclusive environment. At this time, I would like to let everyone know that we will stop recording.